hope is all about, true biblical, eternal hope is all about having and exercising stamina. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, it says that hope deferred, or of course, hope prolonged. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. I want to start there just to open this up today. Solomon, other than Christ, the wisest man who's ever walked on this earth, made it very clear that when you hope for something, you are expecting something, and it doesn't turn out in the result that you wanted to, and especially in the time that you wanted it to, because all of us are impatient. I mean, come on, we, don't, we, we, we want things. Now, I'll speak for myself. I would like things a whole lot sooner than God does. Am I the only one? I got about four or five people agree. I heard a few people laugh, so we're in agreement, right? I, I mean, come on, let's just be honest about this. How, how many of you would like to, everything you need in your life right now that you need done in your life or for your children, for your family, your marriage, your finances, your, 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 your job, your, whatever it is, your business, you would like for God to take care of at least by tomorrow about 9 o'clock. I wouldn't that be nice. We all would, and there's nothing wrong with that. But now, now I, I, don't want to get, I don't want you to get discouraged. I'm here to bring hope to you, okay? But now hear me out. In all probability, everything's not going to be resolved by 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Now, 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 don't leave yet, okay? Stay with me here. But in all likelihood, everything is not going to be resolved by 9 a.m. Monday morning. So the issue is we need to continue in hope even though things haven't been resolved prayers haven't been answered, uh, things still aren't going the way we know they should go according to God's word. So we have to stay the course. Somebody say, stay the, stay the course. And we have to carry on in hope and even carry hope because that is what actually undergirds our faith to see the things accomplished that God has even promised from his word. The longer hope is deferred, the more discouraged you can get. We're all human. It's natural that the longer that hope gets deferred, the longer it gets delayed, the longer it gets pushed out there in the future, the easier it is to get discouraged. The easier it is almost is to give up for that thing, whatever that thing is that you're praying for, you're hoping for, you're believing for it to change and to come to pass. I want you to know right now, Whatever you are hoping for in conjunction with God's word and his goodness in your life, whatever you are hoping for, you have enough hope to see you across the finish line. You already have enough hope before you got into the situation that you need to see a change, that you need a breakthrough, that you need a miracle. You see, long, long before, long before, or Linda experienced that massive stroke, cardiac arrest, and died. Long before she experienced that, God gave her the hope that on the other side of that, when she began to fight her way back, God already put the hope within her that she was going to be healed, that she would be restored, and that she would be made whole by the miraculous power of God. Didn't know when, didn't know exactly how, but she knew and had the hope that it was going to come to pass. You already have the hope. You have enough hope to get you through to the place that you could see the miracle materialize. The very thing you need in your life come to pass. The issue is this. Will you stand in hope until that which is needed will come to pass? Hope, it, 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 it's a beautiful biblical word and terminology. And that's why it's placed all throughout the Bible, of course, all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament. Every person that God used in the Bible and uses today, all of you, God places hope and he, and he causes us to understand the usage of hope and the importance of it. Let me give you just a very brief, a very brief overview of, of some definitive words and phrases of hope. I'm sure you're familiar with these, but, but they bear repeating. Needless to say, the word hope, it means to anticipate. I've, I've condensed, because if you were to etymologize the word hope from both the Hebrew and Greek, you will discover that, that the definition is very extensive. I have, I have just 
drawn it down to like the lowest of the lowest common denominator here to focus on these items. It means to anticipate. There's, there, 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 there is nothing more natural for a child of God to anticipate something good in their life. The reason why you anticipate it, two reasons. One is God gave you the hope slash anticipation, and you are anticipating that God, out of his goodness and by faith, he is going to improve your life or the life of someone you love that you're hoping the best for them, right? To anticipate, it means favorable and confident expectation. Hope is nothing more, I should say, I don't mean that in a demeaning way, it, it's favorable and confident, somebody say confident, expectation. So hope is not this weak thing. Hope is not this, you know, wishy-washy kind of thing. Hope is, is very confident that the expectation that you're placing in God for that thing you need is going to come to pass. And also there again, hope always brings a favorable environment in your mind. We just came off of a series I simply called Imagine That. And we talked a lot about how God gives us biblical precedence of utilizing our mind slash heart, spirit, in order to believe and to see what God wants in store for us. I mean, come on. When, when we envision our future, it's never bad, is it? I mean, come on. All of us envision our future, the future for our spouse, the future for our children. Come on, since, since your children were babies, and my, they grow up fast, don't they? Since they were babies, you had this wonderful, favorable picture of what their life was going to be, Right? Well, that's a God-given thing. It's a God-given gift, and, and it works with hope. That's how hope actually begins to be activated in our life is because we want to see a favorable change in that area in our life. We want to see a favorable improvement. We want to see things improve, not get worse. I think people who are at the lowest part of their life, struggling with so many different things, be it different addictions and, 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 and just be it, you know, just different uh, dysfunctions that have occurred in life and have left them at the lowest level of society. I, 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 never, I never could believe that even people like that anticipated or projected for them to be there. I believe people even in their lowest, their lowest life right now, that's why God has gifted us and blessed us to help people like that, and all people by all means. I believe they always, always had a better picture in their life. I believe no matter what happens in someone's life, they always had a better picture than what they're experiencing when things go bad in their life. And so it is with each and every one of us, and for those we love, we have this favorable picture that we want to see happen in their life. Amen. Amen. Hope has to do, here's like this working definition. Hope has to do with the unseen and the future. Hope will actually begin to write your future if you let it. Hope will begin to actually allow you, before faith comes in, hope is already actively working for you to begin to draw out your dream, draw out your desire. Communicate that with God. Communicate that with, with, those, you know, with people you love, with people who also are like-minded in faith and spirit. So hope always will have you to project something into the future. It's not seen, but that's what you want to see. Because sometimes we see things that we don't want to see. Hope gives us a projection of things that we can't see now, but this is what we want to see in the future. Hope describes the anticipation of good. When I came across that extended definition, when I etymologized the word hope, I came across that and I thought, man, that is so good. Hope describes, there again, this is the working definition of hope. This is how it works in our life. It describes the anticipation of good. So anytime, simple as this, anytime that you are anticipating something good in your life, hope just brought that. Anytime you envision something good in your life, you're anticipating something good in your mind's eye, if you will, hope delivered that. Every time you anticipate something good for your family, your children, your finances, your destiny, your vocation, your business, whatever it is, anytime you are anticipating that, hope, like, you know, just like Amazon, man, hope brings that, knocks on the door, there it is, all you got to do, you open the door. 
You ain't got a sign for it. Isn't that wonderful? But anyway, I mean, it just gets there and it gets there fast. So every time, I just want you to know this, every time, I know this is simple, but just stay with me here. Every time you envision something good in your life, hope is the one that said, here it is. Hope is the one that brought it to you. Hope is the one that delivered it. Now, we know that God doesn't tease his people. We know that God doesn't tease his people. J Jesus teaches that very premise, Sermon on the Mount. He said, you know what? He said, let me do this. I'm going to liken your relationship with your heavenly father like you have with your children. You love your children so much, you would give your life for them. You work two and three jobs for them. You sacrifice for them. You do whatever it takes to give them a better life than you've had. So Jesus said, even though you're like that, God is so much better. But anyway, he said, I'm going to like it in that relationship. And he said, you know what? So if your child comes to you and they ask you for a piece of bread, you give them a rock. If they come to you, and I'm paraphrasing some of this, but it's in the Bible, Matthew 7. If they come to you and they ask for a piece of fish, would, would, would you give them a scorpion? And he went on to say, if you then, being less good than God, know how to give good gifts and good things of all kinds to your children, how much more? In my notes, it says people will be shouting right now. And how, so I say, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? I said all that, now to come back to this. There again, every time you anticipate something good in your life, every time you envision something good in your life, hope brought it. Now, God is the one that sent hope to you. If God, who cannot tease you, and God, who cannot lie, and so if God sent the hope to give you an anticipation of something better than you can ever even imagine... If he sent it and he created it to begin with, do you think he's just teasing you? Let that sink in for a moment because a lot of Christians think God works that way. If God delivered it via hope, he gave it to you so you would receive it. He didn't, he didn't tease you by sending the hope to give that anticipation of a favorable future and not see it occur in your life. Everything that God promises, Paul summarized it this way, all the promises of God in him are yea, meaning yes, affirmative, and in him, amen. The word amen simply means so be it. That's one of the reasons why we pray, we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we seal it by saying amen. Because when you say amen, that settles it. When you say amen, that seals it. When you say amen, that means so be it. By the, by the goodness and gifting and promise of God and by the authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, amen, so be it. So whatever you ask in the name of Christ, amen, so be it, it's done. So back to this. When Paul said all the promises of God in him are yes, they are the affirmative. They're not happenstance, they're not maybe, they're not, well, we'll see. When you were growing up, did you ever go to your parents and say, hey, can, can we go to Disneyland this summer? And they said, we'll see. That was torturous, wasn't it? But anyway, aren't you glad God doesn't say we'll see? God doesn't say we'll see. God already says, here's what I want to do for you. Here's what I will do for you. Here's what I can do for you. Here's what I desire to do for you. God has already given exceeding great and precious promises that we, as Peter said, could be partakers of his divine nature. He's given us so many great and exceeding precious promises. He wants us to have them. He doesn't tease. So there again, he's the one that sent the hope slash the promise, the desired result that's better than you can even imagine. So you begin to hope for that. Well, what in the world happens when we stop hoping? Why did we stop hoping? Why did we give up on it? Why, why do we just you know, get discouraged? It happens to all of us. So from here on out, I really want you to stay with me on this. If you are discouraged on something you've been hoping for, this is for you. If you have even given up hoping 
for something better in your life to happen, this is for you. Tell somebody, hang on. This is really now going to get good for you. Go with me over to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Now, if you're here for the first time, and if it gets a little crazy here in a few minutes, it's not my fault. It's their fault. We, 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 we are a church uh, that, of course, first and foremost, we enjoy our salvation. We don't endure it. Amen. And we, we want to see people enjoy the fullness of God in their life. Now, by all means, just by nature, some of us are more quiet, and that's great. Some are more loud, that's great. You know, so, some of us, you can hear singing, you know, from across uh, this room. And others, you stand right next to them, you can hardly hear them singing. That doesn't matter. Bottom line, however God has geared you, that's who you are. So you just continue to be you, okay? Tell somebody, just continue to be you, right? But, but, at, but at the same time, if, if a few people just get a little loud and crazy, if you only knew what they've been hoping for. If you only knew how long that hope has been deferred in their life, right? Notice this. We're all familiar with these scriptures, but i got to read them. Romans chapter 4, beginning, let's start in verse 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him, referring to God, the presence of God, whom he, referring to Abraham, just want everyone to be on the same page here, presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead... And calls those things which do not exist as though they already do. Calls those things that are not as though they already are. Now, now that's a 10-week teaching, but we don't have time. Let me digress just for a moment. This is the God that you serve. This is how he works. He doesn't wait for something to manifest and then show up. He's the one that long before materializes in your life, He's already spoken it over your life. He's, al he's already decreed it. He's already set it in motion from the foundation of the world. He's already set in motion the very things you need in your life. You know, Jeremiah is this young preacher, young prophet. He's already discouraged. You know, he had great hope and a few things came against him. He's already starting to lose hope against even his destiny and purpose in life. And he's saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm too young and, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, fully educated. And, and he said, you know, I, I didn't come from the upper echelon of the spiritual families of Israel. And he said, you know, I, I got a lot of things going against me here. And, you know, my... My background is blue collar and, and just a lot of things. You know, God, I, 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 I think I'm the wrong guy. I think, I think you really need to call somebody else. And he said, Jeremiah, before I created you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before you were even created, I knew who you were. I knew what you were going to do. I had a call. I had a plan. I had a gift. Before I even formed you in your mother's womb. I already, I, I already planned earth for you and you for earth. I, I already had everything in motion. Don't ever say you're too young. Don't ever say you can't do it. Don't ever say, oh, don't, don't ever say, no, 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 no. My, my hope is lost because I tried and it just didn't work out. Before I created you, I provided everything you will ever need. I gave you the hope to see you through everything, and the faith to see everything accomplished in your life. So no matter what you are going through, God has already prepared everything you will ever need. Long before you were even born, God already prepared everything. So we understand that, that, that Abraham is going through this situation, and then he begins to realize, oh, okay, that, that is the God that I serve. He calls those things that are not as though they already were. He begins to create out of nothing something into my life and for my life. Now notice this shift here. In verse 18, who contrary to hope. Now, that, now we're, we're talking about Abraham, right? Abraham, contrary to hope. Contrary to hope, in hope believed. I like how the King James Version puts it, actually. Who against all hope believed in hope. Who against all hope believed in hope in hope. Real quick, like, brief history on Abraham. He's called, you know, he's 75 years of age when, when God says, okay, it's time. Granted, people lived longer even then, but I mean, he's, he's already, you know, three-fourths of his life away. And God said, okay, here we go. Now it's time. Don't ever think 
it's too late for God to do something miraculous in your life. Amen. Never think it is. Amen. Calls him out from, from Ur of the Chaldees, family connection, all that. Said, uh, he said, I want you to just start leaving, and I'll show you as you go where you're going and what I have in store for you. Abraham takes, of course, his immediate family. He takes Lot, who was a young man at that time because Abraham was responsible for continuing to raise him because Lot's father, Abraham's brother, died. And the day in, in that time, the custom was that the oldest brother or the surviving brother was to take care of your, your brother's family until until basically they, they were set and secure in life, bottom line. So Lot goes with them. Anyway, they just strike out, and some good things happen, some bad things happen, some other bad things happen, some good things happen, some bad things happen, a lot of different things happen, just kind of like life. Somebody say that's life. But anyway, you know, but then some more good things happen. The good always outshine. You ever notice just one good thing can outshine a million bad things? You ever notice that? One good thing from God can turn every bad thing around in your life. One good thing from God, one good word from God, one good act of kindness from God, one good, just one good benevolent act of God can totally erase every bad thing in your whole life and cause you to hope again, dream again, believe again, and have a much better pleasant life. Amen. Just one good thing from God is all it takes to give you stamina to hope all the days of your life. So anyway, some bad things happen. And, you know, even, even Lot turns against him. I mean, his own nephew, his own nephew rises up against him and all of Lot's posse rise up against Abraham. Are you kidding? If it weren't for me, you wouldn't have anything that you have. You know, all, all those possessions. He said, you know, I don't, I don't want to remind you, but just for what it's worth, everything you got was because of me. God's goodness in me through you, through me to you. And now you're going to revolt in all this? Abraham, you know what? It's all right. Somebody say, it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. To the degree that you have hope is a degree you can deal with difficult situations. And Abraham had stamina of hope. He tells Lot, he said, you know what? It, 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 it's no problem, Lot. It's all right. You go your way, I'll go mine. Bottom line, let's just depart in peace. I don't want there to be any strife. Let's depart in peace. And Abraham even said, you know what? Even though it's my, my right to choose first which direction I'm going to go, I'll give you the preference. Lot needs to say he, he takes the choices land. Abraham takes the scraps and the leftovers. I'm going to tell you something, though. When you're in God's will, God will bless the scraps and the leftovers a million times bigger and better than what seems to be the most fruitful and prosperous way. That ought to make somebody happy. Somebody just got a word right there. So if life has dealt you scraps and people have dealt you scraps and people have given you the leftovers of the leftovers, one touch from God can turn that around and make that more fruitful and more prosperous and more blessed than you can ever even imagine. If you'll just continue to stand in hope. Somebody say, stand in hope. So Abraham, so that happens, and then different other things happen. It's been 25 years. There's a time span. 25 years, God didn't even talk to him. He didn't, hear the, he didn't hear the voice of God for almost 25 years. 25 years from the time he promised Isaac until Isaac was born, never heard that again. Didn't see it. 25 years, he's walking in hope. I want to say this again. I'm, not be, I'm being purposely redundant. 25 years, he's walking in hope that what God had promised him, he's going to do it. That stamina of hope. 25 years. Come on, some Christians today can't walk 25 minutes. 25 hours. 25 days. So, 25 months? Uh-uh. 25 years, he's walking in hope. That stamina of hope. So that's what, that's what Paul is referring to in verse 18, referring to Abraham, who against hope, against all the odds, against the breakthrough, against the prayers being answered, against the miracle being manifested, against things turning around, against things turning better out for him, against his purpose being completely fulfilled, against his destiny being completely reached, against all of those things, against all of those things, he continued to hope against it. That's the definition of stamina of hope, is that when you still hope against, meaning you are pushing back on the thing that's trying to push you over. When your hope is so strong 
that you will not only stand your ground, that you will not only exercise standment of hope, but that you begin to push back against the hope that's trying to literally be eviscerated from your spirit. Is that you stand your ground, you declare that I know it doesn't look good right now. I know you may think I'm crazy. I know what the doctors have said. I know what my family has said. I know what the economy looks like. I know what the job market, whatever it is, I know what it looks like. But in spite of all of that, I'm going to stand my ground and against hope, even though it seems to be hopeless, I'm going to hope like never before that my miracle, my breakthrough for my family, myself, it's going to happen in Jesus' name. What other option do you have? What other option do we have but to continue to stand in hope? Who against hope believed in hope. Going on to say, let's just read a little bit more about this. Notice this. Against hope he believed in hope that he would become the father of many nations. See, there's a reason why you have standment of hope. Abraham, the reason why he was continued to stand in hope was because a promise God made to him. That's what kept him faithful. That's what kept him going. Sometimes all you got is a promise, but that's all you need. You know, you know one of the many reasons why you, you go to church, especially this one, is because every Sunday you're reminded one way or another by what I say or by the power of the Holy Spirit, moving in your spirit, by what God has promised you, he's able also to perform. That that promise you're hoping for, to be fulfilled, that it becomes refreshed and renewed. Because, see, we cannot live by bread alone, but we live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And there was a reason why in the Old Testament, under the, in the Mosaic Tabernacle, Levitical Priesthood Order, is that that showbread, it spoke of the living bread, Christ, referring to, of course, this bread of life. He being the bread of life in you know, incarnate, this being the bread of life in written form. There was a reason why it was changed out every seven days. The reason why is because you needed to be renewed with that bread. There needed to be a renewing of the bread of life to you. That's one of the main reasons why you should be in the house of God every given Sunday, yes. other than when you're on vacation in Maui and take me next time. But <laughs> the other reason, the reason is because that bread of life needs to be renewed. Every given Sunday, there needs to be a freshness. That means all throughout the week, you need to live on that bread of life yourself. But when you come to the house of God, when you partake together in a corporate setting of the bread of life, it, re it, it reinvigorates the promise. It gives you more hope. How many of you, when you leave here on a Sunday morning, I know all of you, but anyway, when you leave here on a Sunday morning, you're ready to take on another week. You're, you're, you're ready to face any giant. You're ready to face any devil out there. You are ready to overcome any obstacle on your job or with your business or with people you're going to face because we, we don't have blue Mondays. We have victorious Mondays around here. We don't have sad Mondays. We don't have down Mondays. We don't have, oh, we can't wait till Friday. No, every single day, this is the day that the Lord has made, especially Sunday, of course. Why? Because we hope, we hope eternal, and every day our hope continues to get us closer to the fulfillment of what promise God has given unto us. Notice as it goes on to say, and, and not being weak in faith, Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. But Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief because he believed, he, his faith was so strong that he believed that God, who God had promised, he was able also to perform. Now see, this is where faith kicks in, which next week is standment of faith, but you gotta start with standment of hope. Because hope, it gives the picture for what faith uh, focuses on. Hope brings the desired result of what you want to see in your life. Hope actually sets the stage and opens up the curtains of this is what I want to occur in my life. And then faith begins to be activated by what your hope already brought within your spirit. So that's why you ever notice in Hebrews 11.1, now faith is a substance of things hoped for. 
You, you ever notice that, that faith is in the present and hope is in past tense? Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is present tense, hope is past tense. Because Hope always has to come on the scene first before faith comes in. You are projecting your faith based upon something you're hoping for. There again, God brought you the package of hope. Remember, he delivered it on your doorstep, called your spirit, your soul. God delivered it in, on your doorstep. That was the package of hope. That hope began to show you this is what my life can be like. This is the improvement of my life according to God's word. This, this, this is what I see happening in a good sense for myself, my, my marriage, my children, my grandchildren, my finances, my job. My, you, you name it, whatever it is, God gave you the picture because he delivered hope to you. Now, when you have hope, then faith comes on the scene because hope's already there. Actually, hope is in the past tense, but it never leaves. Real quick, like, the language in Hebrew and Greek, the tense of the verb is, is it's in perpetuity. So, um, like this, Hebrews 13, uh, which declares Jesus Christ is same yesterday, today, and forever, right? Now, the thing about it is, in the tense of the verb, in the Greek language or Hebrew, they don't have to say yesterday, today, and forever, because... In those languages, uh, it, it's always in perpetuity. It's always past, present, and future. Because that's who God is. God was in your past, he's in your present, and he'll be in your future. Yeah. Jesus Christ is same yesterday, past, today, present, forever, future. So this is how God works in our life. Hope. Now, hope, there again, it's past, present, and future, but hope will be in the past when it comes to a faith objective. Am I helping anybody here? Amen. It's because now you are projecting your faith toward this issue in life that you first had hope for. Now, the hope sees you through it by all means. It stands with you when you stand in hope. You always stand in God by all means because he's the God of all hope. So when you are standing in hope, you're standing in God. When you're standing in God, you're standing in hope. You know, we, we get the um, natural phraseology that hope springs eternal. Well, where that comes from is the Bible. Because there again, he's the God of all hope. God always has hope purveying from him toward his children. The reason why your hope hasn't been dashed, even though you might have gotten discouraged and maybe even disconnected a little bit, but you get re-engaged real quick, is because God's eternal hope is flowing into you all the days of your life. How many of you have ever been at a place in your life where it would have been easier to quit than to continue? In a lot of different areas, right, in your life, right? Do you recall? Oh, where'd the time go? We gotta wrap this up. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta bring this out, though. None of us like, none of us like to feel hopeless. None of us like to feel like, wow, well, why didn't it work out? Why hasn't it worked out? You move past, if you're not careful, you move past from if it's going to work out and when it's going to work out to I guess it's not going to work out. And even if it's for a moment, you know, you almost entertain that. I have trouble with Christians saying, oh, I've never felt that way. You know what? You've never hit bottom then. Right. You've, you, you've never had something devastate you enough to where it would have been easier to say, you know what? What's the use? What's the use? You read your Bible close enough, Elijah said that very thing. We've all been there one time, one degree or another. But do you recall this? There again, talking about the eternal hope that you have. It's called stamina hope. We don't like those dark, dank places of our soul and spirit when it, when it just seems like, man, nothing is going right here. It seems to go from bad to worse and one thing to another. 
and nothing is turning in the right direction. You get to the point and just say, forget this. And then you actually tried to forget it. You actually said, you know what? Guess it wasn't meant to be. And then you even started or at least tried to start going your own way or another way. I'm not even talking about walking away from God. I'm just talking about going the opposite way of what you used to hope for. Because you got to the place where, you know what? I guess it wasn't meant to be. You just leave it. Leave the hope there. Stand in the hope there. I'm out. You tried to walk away from it. You tried to desert the hope. And you were at another place at another time totally disconnected and disjointed from what you walked away from. And out of nowhere, something just rose up on the inside of you and put some fight on the inside of you to go back there, stand your ground, and don't you give up until God has turned things around. Because hope cannot die. When God gives you hope for something, it cannot die. It may diminish. It may go through cycles. It may even, you think, has even escaped you. But it cannot die. As long as you have hope in anything that God has promised you, God will resurrect your hope until you see the very thing come to pass in your life. You ain't over. It's not over in your life. You're not going to quit. You're not going to say, oh, you know, I guess it wasn't meant to be. God's going to put some fight on the inside of you. He's going to put a fire on the inside of you that you're going to stand your ground and have some stamina of hope to see things turn around for your life. Somebody shout. Somebody say amen to that. For more information about our teaching resources, visit our website at ciclive.com.